All right, thank you very much. Sounds to me like you can hear me. Um, okay, so um, I also just want to say thank you to Matthias for inviting me here. And um, I only met uh, Matthias more recently than most of you, I think only five years ago, uh, Matthias uh, showed up in my room in, uh, in Boston. And now I'm so lucky that, um, well, he has a connection to Denmark, as do I. So yes, I am transitioning back to Denmark and I'm, I'm happy to be doing so, but I'm also happy that there are some world men in Copenhagen. So it's not just returning home to uh, what was 20 years ago when I left. So I often ask uh, myself this question, and I'm, I don't know if that's also what you're wondering since I'm here. What can I do here uh, for one of you, for you, as an epidemiologist? So I just thought um, I'd try to make it kind of um, start a little introduction. It is not, um, I don't, I clearly don't have any data yet because I think we're just at the beginning uh, point of this. But um, for me, epidemiology is the shift to prevention and really a focus on looking at people way before they get disease. And so the question is, as Nikolai just alluded to, can we then uh, use the proteomic profile to predict the future, uh, the onset of disease? again with an emphasis on the future. So in this case, um, for Nikolai's data, I would say we should have a look at what are these participants hospitalized for, and also in my data, I could just adjust for BMI. I don't have to sample on anything because that's what happens in the doctor's office. We see the patient and um, we have to be able to control for the things that we know are risk factors. So I thought just a quick example of a single biomarker that um, has been one of the last to cut onto the market in the US and be approved and used a lot um, in the clinic. And just to give an example of what epidemiology did uh, and what's necessary for, for this to happen and for this to be implemented. So this is the history of CRP uh, which is 100 years uh, ago basically since it was first discovered but I think we can actually skip all the way to um, maybe we're around here now with the proteomics or even when Paul Ritger and Nada Rifai uh, developed the high sensitive CRP assay. That is really uh, the point where uh, CRP could go from just being measured uh, to, to be uh, now so sensitive that even in patient samples that I work with, which may have been stored for 20 to 30 years before people had any kind of disease, um, now, uh, sen uh, high sensitive CRP could be uh, assessed in these samples. So before that, you would have uh, a lot of contamination in the samples that you could see in the actual CRP levels, meaning it, it, it can't be used for prediction of future risk. So um, you will also note here that uh, one of the first epidemiological studies um, that actually showed that CRP could predict the risk of uh, heart disease in the elderly, so in people who were free of heart disease previously but might have had other elderly conditions, um, it could predict risk of heart disease independent of other risk factors. Was the cardiovascular health study, which I'm going to come back to later. Then once the high sensitive CRP assay was developed, um, Paul Ritker really um, has replicated this in various popu uh, populations of healthy people. And I think the key here is as he published it over and over, the impact factor of the papers also was growing at the same time because the first time you publish something new, um, it was really not in a, in a journal that any of us were reading at that time. And so I'm really lucky because uh, I am teaching a cardiovascular epidemiology course in Boston and Paul Ritker comes every year, so I get an update every year on what's happening with CRP and I learn something new each time. And so um, this is around the time when I became faculty and I started and uh, the Jupiter trial had just come out showing that even when you have um, low LDL, if you stratify on CRP, you can still lower the risk of, CR of C CHD even further. But also Mendelian randomization is a technique that epidemiologists like to use as a randomized clinical trial where we're looking at the genetic variants that control some of the variation in the biomarker of interest. And so uh, at the same, this is something that we epidemiologists were doing at the time showing that CRP does not look to be causal 
Um, so if the genetic variants that would raise CRP levels were not related to heart disease risk. And this really did not hold back uh, Dr. Ritker, because he just came back <laughs> much stronger with two trials. One is called the Cantos trial, it just recently came out. And um, basically what he and his group did was they started to look more into the biology and they um, went upstream and IL-1 beta is really uh, the determinant of CRP levels and now he no longer gives a lecture on CRP but on inflammation. So this is really a huge um, learning um, lesson for me as well that really um, now he's talking about what, what can happen if we inhibit inflammation per se, per se and CRP is just a marker but we still have it in clinic already. At this point for the future going forward for CRP I don't think that there are many diseases uh, of chronic lifestyle diseases uh, left that we can't relate CRP to because as we know it's quite ubiquitous for inflammation so it's become a little bit um, like same thing but there's this huge um, um, reduction in lung cancer seen in the cancer trial that potentially something really interesting and new for them to keep developing. So. I'm here as an epidemiologist just to say what are some of the take home messages if we study this as an example. So really it was to, to start where uh, I think a lot of the studies that you have presented through today is um, cross-sectional studies that demonstrate elevations in a patient sample. We can also look among high risk patient group where we're sure we're gonna have enough recurrent events that we will have statistical power enough to be able to find something this can create an early uh, success um, and is more safe uh, before we move into the truly prospective studies and healthy participants looking at the risk of disease. And this is where the replication and replication and the large patient numbers are gonna set in because we're gonna be taking it to the population level. Um, next up will then be to demonstrate can you change the level of the biomarker and do the changes in that biomarker lead to changes in your risk of whatever disease you're looking at, in this case, heart disease. For instance, um, this is kind of important for all the new novel drug trials. So I'm still talking cardiovascular disease. We, um, we don't have any good targets yet for inflammation. We call it the residual risk of heart disease. CRP uh, could already be used as an early marker of with the, which direction is this trial of this new drug going. Um, and perhaps um, save um, time. And then um, what they did at the same time, I was saying that they really were expanding the biology, going upstream, and the entire bio biology around inflammation. And so also, for sure, they were lucky that we don't really have any other great markers of inflammation. So um, that is also a take-home <laughs> message if you wanna get in. So uh, part of the... Um, the field for cardiovascular epidemiology are these sort of established markers that we have to use and assess in these studies to prove whether or not we're really improving upon what's already known. So we already have uh, various risk scores for cardiovascular disease where the newest one has CRP in it. But the ROC curve for um, heart disease is already really high and it's very unlikely that we're gonna really be, be, be moving this a lot uh, with any new proteomics and you really have to be able to prove any kind of cost effectiveness above and beyond these factors that the doctor will have readily available um, anyway. So um, uh, these are the criteria published it's quite a few years ago from the American Heart Association that I think are still very valid if you want to get onto um, the doctor's office and into the clinic. The only thing that I really question because I have done a lot of Mendelian randomization studies is this question of causality because clearly CRP proves the point that it does not need to be causal if there's no other marker in the, in the, in the pathway. So, sorry to be presenting um, from, uh, this is the somalogic scan, but just wanted to uh, show an example where this has been applied. So you can see a, a pretty recent publication of the soma scan in two cohorts. Um, if they just run it, um, univariate analysis, out of the 1,100 proteins, they get 200 that are nominally significant. They do the lasso approach to find the minimum number of proteins needed to describe this variation and I think even 
from my viewpoint, I know you can have criticize, criticism from proteomics community, but even from epidemiological community, we can discuss and question if this is the best way to analyze these data. But they come up with this nine protein risk score that really um, predict, predicted the risk of heart disease. But as you can tell, it barely moves um, the ROC curve uh, above and beyond the Framingham risk scores. So it's not really adding any value. And this is even prob probably in a scenario where this, um, the, the Framingham score itself is usually higher than this already. So um, they don't have a great uh, cohort because this was a cohort of participants who already had heart disease where you're looking at recurrent events. If you're looking at healthy people, this would be expected to be quite higher. But what is interesting is um, that in my other field of research, I've really focused on the biology of an association between HDL cholesterol and heart disease, um, which is extremely strong and super independent of other risk factors. Yet, we don't have any way of understanding what it is functionally that HDL cholesterol does, because all the trials so far that have actually put like, um, kind of like a, a stop to the HDL metabolism pathway have not resulted in a lower risk of heart disease. So we still um, question this pathway, and I've been looking at some other uh, uh, lab measures that we're developing uh, downstairs um, to try to understand this. But basically, if you go to one of the big trials, which is the CTP inhibitors, that resulted in much higher risk of heart disease for those participants who had more than doubling of their HDL levels. They also found with a SOMA scan that the proteins all were changing in an adverse direction. Already at three months, they saw it uh, reflected in this nine protein risk score. So perhaps uh, we could have, we could use that uh, protein marker for early detection of harm in trials of novel drugs in different diseases. So. Um, this is also just in uh, basically what has happened since Matthias came into my office five years ago. I started to talk more with Philip, and um, so this is the work um, that I have been doing with other biomarkers. It's basically looking at blood samples from large cohort studies of healthy individuals where we have repeated assessments of uh, different kind of like um, brain scans or um, cognitive assessments, food frequency questionnaires, adjudicated events, and glucose tests, and a range of biomarkers. And these are just examples of, of three cohorts where there's a range of endpoints where this assay uh, the, or the proteomic profiling could be related to in such a fashion, much like um, what I just showed, but perhaps where we could make a smarter analytic strategy. But. Um, I have been speaking mostly about heart disease until now, but I think that there's a, a range of diseases out there where this is potentially even more interesting because, like I said, for heart disease, we already have an ROC curve nearly at 80%, so we can't really improve the prediction much. But such diseases like dementia and Parkinson's, which was mentioned earlier, um, we don't have any biomarkers. And it's been said that some of the earliest changes um, for, uh, for dementia is even decades before you might be able to see something on a PET scan. But it would be very nice if we had something cheaper and non-invasive to predict your risk of dementia. And um, this is not only complicated for uh, the proteomics part of it, it's also complicated for an epidemiologist to be in fields of chronic diseases where we're gonna require a blood sample stored before they had any kind of pathological changes because we want to make sure we're not just capturing the underlying pathology reflected in the proteomic signature um, in these participants, which is the same as reverse causation. Because if we really want to talk about the prediction and understand the biology, we need to get to these participants before. So we need to have m available measurements on these cofactors. And this is hard to advance at a time where we have diseases such as dementia where we can't even agree on the outcome definition. Um, in the Alzheimer's community, we are talking about beta amyloid and tau, and then there's the vascular dementia where perhaps cognition is more important than the white matter in the brain. And so these cohorts are just continuing and we need to start basically by diagnosing and reclassifying disease. And so you have talked about black boxes today and I am talking about a different kind of black box. To me, uh, now that I am 
kind of moving a little bit from plasma to tissue because in uh, Copenhagen I am specifically recruited to work on the big pathological biobank of over 30 million tissue samples collected from Danish participants who ever came in for any kind of biopsy. And we can link them through disease registers to look at basically what happened to them and also their past history. Uh, and we also have weight uh, from school health records. And so for me, um, I'm employed there as the epidemiologist to try to design the studies and the best epidemiological designs for targeting these 30 million tissues. And so this is where uh, my black box comes in because I think that the tissue profile is especially valuable in diseases such as dementia, fatty liver, other diseases where we basically need a biopsy to truly see. There's not an ICD code. For instance, for heart disease, we have an ICD code. It's pretty clear the person had a, a heart attack. But for fatty liver, until you actually see the biopsy of the liver, it seems that in America, perhaps 60% of the population has fatty liver, but really only a small fraction of these will go on to develop something really seriously. So we can select in the registers based on those who uh, live for a really long time, perhaps with a kind of benign fatty liver versus those that quickly develop cirrhosis and, and go on. So that is my uh, vision and hope for uh, the next steps that after we have uh, basically um, reclassified some of these um, black box diseases that are prevalent but where we don't really know um, what their project pr projection is, then perhaps we can um, try to look at plasma markers and see if we can find, uh, go on and do for them what we did for heart disease already. So with that, I just also want to thank everybody and um, I'll take any questions and uh, also feedback if um, yeah, how epidemiology fits into your world. Thank you.